It is now 11 o'clock. Thank you for being here. We are now dismissed. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here today. I want to welcome you to the services of the Pinnacle Church of Christ, where we are living and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. On behalf of our leadership, our elders, uh, we're so glad that you're here with us today. Uh, we are very, very thankful to God that things are moving uh, in a positive direction. God is blessing us uh, to be able to slowly, carefully come back together again. And uh, we know that we're moving into the, the fall and, and winter months, and that presents uh, some challenges. But we are making preparation for uh, those eventualities, and our elders have done a terrific job of trying to make sure that uh, all of the decisions that are made are made with an abundance of caution with you and your safety in mind. And so we appreciate you being here today. Uh, we appreciate you being compliant with the safety guidelines that um, have been set forth. And we honestly believe that if everyone will just work together, uh, we can get through this God being our helper. Um, today, we want to say a special welcome to those that are joining us via uh, the live stream. We know that there is a growing number of folks that are watching uh, via the live stream, and we appreciate you tuning in each and every week so very much. Um, want to just say, listen, we know that there are some who have compromised immune systems. There are some folks that are in situations where they really should not uh, be here. We understand that. Uh, if the time is not right for you, uh, we totally, totally understand. But whenever the time is right, we want you to know that there's a place for you here at the Pinnacle Church of Christ. And so we appreciate that so much. Appreciate those that are worshiping out on the parking lot. That parking lot option is, uh, is a good option for a lot of folks. And uh, last Sunday, I looked out there, and I thought it was a tailgate party going on, folks. <laughs> waiting to see the hamburgers and hot dogs come out. But um, do not forget about our online content. We do have a full slate of online content you see on the screen there on Wednesday evenings at 6 p.m., our Wednesday class discussion. Uh, also... We have a brand new class that will be starting uh, on November the 8th. Jackson House is going to be uh, teaching an online class out of the book of Philippians. And we certainly want to encourage you to tune in for that and participate in that. It's going to be an interesting format, a Zoom format. Uh, and a lot of people are kind of scared off by that Zoom. It's so simple. Uh, even Chuck can do it. <laughs> He's smiling under the mask. Just click on the link that's available on our Facebook page, and that'll take you into the class. And there you can interact with Jackson as he teaches. And so we're looking forward to a great time and encourage you to participate. And that'll start next Sunday evening at 5 p.m. Um, if you are visiting with us today, we want you to know that you are our honored and welcome guest. And there's a little card uh, in the back of the seat in front of you. But we know we're in an environment where we don't like to touch a whole lot of things. And so if you would prefer... On the back of the place card in your pew or pew chair, uh, there's a little QR code. And if you will scan that with your smartphone, it'll take you to online um, guest registration. And you can do that without having to touch anything, and we'll get that information. But we are so glad that you're here with us today, and we appreciate that so much. And also just want to make it known that uh, Tim and Laura Hamilton have uh, made known their desire to place membership here at the Pinnacle Church, and we are just delighted to have Tim and Laura with us. I won't embarrass them and ask them to stand way back there in the back, but if you see Tim and Laura this morning, be sure and uh, give them a, a chicken wing or a high five and let them know that you're glad that they're here with us. And if you are considering a place to serve the Lord with you and your family, we would love to have you here at the Pinnacle Church of Christ. Uh, talk to any of the elders or to Chuck or myself, and we can answer any questions that you might have. During our um, um, time together, uh, we are especially happy when uh, we have those that are um, starting a new life together, and that's going to be the case with Jeff Zern and uh, Rochelle Wooten. Uh, they are soon to be wed, and we're having a drive through wedding shower for them on Saturday, this coming Saturday, uh, 1 o'clock to 2.30 p.m. It's going to be at the home of the Boatwrights. And uh, there's more information about that out on our uh, Facebook page. But let's encourage uh, Jeff and Rochelle and those of you that can and will participate in the drive through shower. During our communion service today, we ask that those that are watching at home, please participate with us. And hopefully everyone that came in uh, got the little packet with the communion um, there. It's the self-contained 
uh, packets. We won't pass any trays around or anything of that nature. Also in that little packet, there's an envelope, which is a convenient way for you to take care of your offering. And uh, we, again, won't pass any collection trays or things of that nature. But there is a receptacle as you exit through the double doors. And if you'll deposit your contribution there, uh, that may be a convenient way for you to do that. Again, we're so thankful for each and every one that's here today. And as we get ready to worship, please remember those who have asked for prayer in a special way. We do want to remember our sister, uh, Adeline Browner. Uh, Adeline lost her brother, uh, Bill Grace, this past week. And uh, we certainly want to remember um, Adeline and the Browner family in a special way. Also want to remember Tim. Uh, Tim um, is having some back difficulties and possibly facing some surgery, and we do want to keep him lifted up in prayer. Do remember uh, Wilma Graham as she uh, goes through her treatments. Um, Steve Huffstedler um, is going through some treatments as well and solicits our prayers. And there are many others on the prayer list. We won't call all of the names today. But as Randy gets ready to lead us in songs of praises to God, would you bow with me this morning? Gracious Heavenly Father, we are truly thankful for this opportunity to come together as, as a body of believers. Uh, we come for no other reason, Heavenly Father, than to give you thanks and praise for all the many blessings that you bestow. And Father, in the midst of all that's going on in this world, we, we know that you are a, a good and just God. Father, we just praise you. We ask that all that we do and all that would say that would, would, would renown to your glory and honor this day. Father, we are especially mindful of these that have uh, requested prayers of the church. Uh, we ask that you'd be with those that are going through times of illness, that you would give them strength, work through the doctors and the nurses to bring about the healing that they stand in need of. And Father, especially for those that have lost loved ones, we just ask that you'd give them comfort, um, strength as only you can. Father, be with each of us as we strive to live for you. Forgive us when we fall short and give us a home in heaven. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Randy? Good morning. As we begin our worship today, Brother Jess Stevenson will lead us in our communion meditation at the proper time. Brother Eric Martin will close us with prayer. In between, Brother David Wallace will have a scripture reading. We'll sing, uh, sing to me of heaven. Uh, be still and know. Take time to be holy. That'll be the songs before we have our communion, then Lord, I'm coming home and hold to God's unchanging hand will be our, our closing song. Hope you're here to sing, worship, and praise God. Let's stand together as we sing this first song, Sing to Me of Heaven. Sing to me of heaven, sing that song of peace. From the toils that blind me it will bring release. Burdens will be lifted that are pressing so. Showers of great blessing o'er my heart will flow. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its gold and glory of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven, sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven as I walk alone, dreaming of the comrades that so long have gone. In a fairer region among the angel throng, they are happy as they sing that old sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven's sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven tenderly and low, till the shadows o'er me rise and swiftly go. When my heart is weary, when the day is long, sing to me of heaven, sing that old sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven's sweetest song of all. You see, please. <clears throat> Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that. 
and I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I am the Lord that strengthens thee. I am the Lord that strengthens thee. I am the Lord that strengthens thee. Take time to be holy. Speak off with thy Lord. Abide in him always and heed on his word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak, forgetting and nothing, and blessings to see. Take time to be holy, the word rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. Abiding in Jesus like him that shall be. Thy friends in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, let him be thy guide, and run not before him, what ever be tied. In joy or in sorrow, still follow thy Lord. And looking to Jesus, still trust in his word. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive be neath his control. Thus led by his spirit to fountains of love, thou soon shall be fitted for service above. Let's pray for the bread. Father God, we come before you today recognizing the sacrifice that you made by sending your son to die on the cross that we might have forgiveness of our sins. Father, we pray as we reflect and remember and partake of this communion that we will put that into practice this week and practice forgiveness with our families, our friends, our co-workers, and those that that might wrong us in in this world. Pray that you'd bless each person that partakes of this bread that represents the broken body of your son, Jesus, on the cross. It's in his name we pray. Amen. bow again as we have prayer for the juice. Father God, once again, we 
remember the sacrifice of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. As we partake of this fruit of the vine now, help us to remember that sacrifice and what it meant for you to, to send him to do that and for Jesus to willingly submit to it. Pray that you bless each person that partakes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take the time now to say a prayer for the offering. Father God, we're mindful of the tremendous suffering that's happened economically in the last eight months or so. We pray that you'd bless all the people that have lost their jobs and lost their businesses. And we pray that you'd help people get back on their feet and the, the economy to recover. And Father, as we take this time to give back a portion of of what you've given us and blessed us with, we pray that you'd be with the elders and the leadership here as they decide how to best use those funds that that we have here for our use to further your kingdom, that we would be able to help people in this congregation that need help and, and those in our community. Bless each person that gives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. morning we'll have a reading before our sermon today please join me in Matthew 22 Matthew chapter 22 we'll begin in verse 15 then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his words And they sent their disciples to him, and along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of God truthfully, and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me a coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. And he said, Therefore, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. text that we'll be looking at in just a few minutes will be from 1 Timothy chapter 2. You can start turning there in your Bibles, if you will. Appreciate your presence here today. We appreciate the presence of everyone who's watching online. As Randy was leading us in the singing of that beautiful hymn just a few minutes ago, I was a little convicted, thinking I could have used those sentiments yesterday afternoon. Take time to be holy. Be calm in thy soul, each thought and each motive beneath his control. I have it on good uh, word that uh, those words were written by a Michigan fan watching Jim Harbaugh coach his team. We could certainly use a little holiness there. Sorry about the hogs last night, but the hogs at least are going in the right direction while my boys are stuck in the mud. So uh, there is that. I do appreciate uh, Jeffrey Zern and Rochelle Wooten, though, for getting married in a couple of weeks. That gives me something else to do on a Saturday other than watch football. So if any of you would like to get married, I volunteer my services gratis to do that. Some of you would like to renew your vows. 
I'm your man. Uh, just make sure it's at the same time as the football game on Saturday. And uh, you'll win, and I'll win, and we'll win. So there's that. Uh, Paul said some rather jarring words when they were written somewhere around uh, the sixth uh, decade of the first century. In 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 4, the Bible says, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made by everyone, for kings and for all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. A few questions to mull over this morning. Have you prayed lately for those in authority? Have you given thanks for them? Have you griped about them? Have you cursed them? Hopefully not. Do you realize that Nero, a complete degenerate of a human being, was in power when Paul wrote these words? Can you imagine some Christian standing up and saying, he's not my emperor? Not likely. Scripture says of Abraham in Hebrews 11 and verse 10, he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Now, we look forward one day to taking up permanent residence in that city of God. But for now, we currently dwell in the city of man, where sometimes they have elections. Perhaps you've heard about one being held in a couple of days on Tuesday. Matt Taibbi writes a few things worth considering. He says, well, it's over, or almost over, thankfully. What we Americans go through to pick a president is not only crazy and unnecessary, but genuinely abusive. Hundreds of millions of dollars are spent in a craven, cynical effort to stir up hatred and anger on both sides. A decision that in reality takes one or two days of careful research to make, is somehow stretched out into a process that involves two years of relentless, suffocating mind warfare, an onslaught of toxic media messaging directed at liberals, conservatives, and everyone in between, that by election day makes every dinner conversation dangerous and literally divides families. Politicians are much to blame for this, but we in the media have to take responsibility for the damage we do to the American psyche in the name of election coverage. At this very moment, there are people all over the country who are stocking up on canned goods and ammo for the apocalypse that they believe will come if Trump is reelected or if Biden is elected. For the broadcast business to be successful, viewers need to be not only merely interested in our political melodramas, they have to be in an absolute state about them, emotionally invested in the outcome and frightened not to watch what happens next. And any person who's been subjected to 720 consecutive days of propaganda is not likely to take the news well if he gets the wrong result, whether it's a victory for Biden or a victory for Trump. By that point, the networks have spent two years finding new ways to convince her that the world is going to disintegrate into some commie or Hitlerian version of Mad Max to keep them coming back and watching ads. It obviously matters who gets to be president, and it's perfectly valid for us media types to advocate the candidate that we think is more qualified based on our reporting. But the hype 
has gotten so out of control. It's become bigger than the presidency itself. In every race, there are not two, but three dominating figures. The Democrat, the Republican, and the process. And we're raising whole generations who hate the process far more than they like either of the candidates. Mainly for grim commercial reasons, we in the media manipulate people to stay wired on hate and panic focused on the race for every waking moment indifferent to how much this process depresses everyone. In so doing, we rob people of their patriotism and their desire to vote. If the process is so clearly wrong, how right can the candidates be? If we did this right, people would come out of presidential elections exhilarated, maybe even stoked to get involved in their local races for the county sheriff or the DA. Such races would likely have more of an impact on their day-to-day lives. For the most part, when it comes to our daily routines, the president might as well be on Mars. Instead, most of us come out of the election exhausted, in desperate need of a couple of ambience, and determined to spend the next two years buried in Hulu reruns, afraid to even pass a news channel, while couch surfing our way to a storage wars or a lifetime movie. And I hear there's a new Mandalorian series out, so maybe you want to do that. What makes us feel pessimistic about the world, ultimately, is the way the media encourages us to believe that our fate hangs on every move of the promise-breaking, terminally disappointing Teflon liars in Washington. And that's a shame. Because feeling optimistic shouldn't require turning off the television or turning out the process. What we're witnessing, after all, is the world's greatest contest for power. An amazing fairy tale full of iconic moments that we'll watch no matter how much that Tucker Carlson or Rachel Maddow screams at us. But it would be awesome next time if we could find a way to turn down the volume. Not much to argue with in there, is there? By now, most of us are weary of all of this. And there are preachers in pulpits, even as we speak, telling people who to vote for. If that's what you came for, you're going to be severely disappointed. Because I'm not going to do that. You know, a lot of folks have been feeding on this coverage with almost every waking moment. A lot of the rest of us have been watching baseball. Anybody watch? Baseball is pretty interesting this year. I liked it. With an election looming that has a lot of Christians as taut as a banjo string, I suspect there are a few truths that perhaps we would do well to be reminded of. Let me share with you three, and then more or less the lesson will be yours. First, Don't buy the lie that Caesar is God. He's not, and he never has been. Look again at the words that David read for us a moment ago from Matthew 22. There are a couple of very clear conclusions that Jesus reaches here. The first is that Jesus says, to some people's surprise, that government has the right to exist even bad government. So if you want to sit around and gripe if Trump gets reelected or if Biden gets elected, just remember something. In the first century, they had it a lot worse than we did. They really did. When Paul is writing these words in 1 Timothy 2, when Jesus is saying these words in Matthew 22, the Jews were not in control of their own country. Roman rule was hardly a walk in the park for its Jewish subjects. Now, there were some benefits, to be sure. Benefits like law, order, good roads, aqueducts bringing in drinkable water, and the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, 
They were still being ruled by an occupying foreign power. Now, to put that in perspective, the Democrats largely hate the Republicans, and the Republicans hate the Democrats today. But we're all Americans the last time I looked. These were Jews being ruled by Romans, a foreign occupying power who had the boot firmly planted on their neck. And yet of this power, Paul would say these words, there is no authority except that which God has established, Romans 13.1. So does that mean that God's stamp of approval is on every corrupt regime and every bad leader? Not necessarily. What it is saying is this. Even bad leaders generally can maintain some type of good order. And in that sense, even bad government is preferable to no government at all. That's something we need to understand. In a time when people want to defund the police and defund this and defund that, start defunding these things and see what happens. You're going to be living in a Mad Max world where it's every man, every woman for themselves. I don't think that that's what anyone wants. Are there improvements that need to be made? Of course. But recognize that even bad government is preferable to no government. And here's another thing that Jesus would remind us of. Don't confuse the person who rules with the ruler. They didn't have any interest in some question about taxation or marginal taxation rates. That wasn't what this exchange was about. They were trying to trip Jesus and trap him. Because what's going to happen if Jesus says no You should not pay taxes to the Romans. Then they go and rat him out to the Romans, and they arrest him on charges of sedition. If he says yes, then Jesus is a traitor to his own Jewish people. It's one of those situations you can't win, except Jesus is smarter than them by half, at least. So Jesus calls for a coin. They bring the coin forward. Well, whose whose inscription is this? Whose likeness? Caesar then give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. That's a pretty good answer. And you know what else it covers? Only this. Do you know what the Caesars were moving toward at this time? It wasn't as bad under Augustus as, say, it would be under Nero or Domitian. But they're already moving forward to have a cult of emperor worship. It's not enough to say, I pledge allegiance to the emperor. You have to say that Caesar is Lord, or Caesar is a god. And Jesus is saying he most certainly is not. So these idolatrous claims that are made by Caesar, no. If you got to pay taxes to Caesar, then pay taxes to him. But you don't worship him. Do you think that message might be needed today? We got people on either side of the political divide that you would think that it's Jesus himself coming back to fix all of our problems. I hope you understand how ridiculous that is. Don't confuse the person who rules temporally here with the real ruler, which is God. Here's the second thing we might need to be reminded of. Don't look to government to accomplish what only God can do. There's a very interesting exchange in Isaiah chapter 30. And boy, the people of God had all kinds of problems, always trying to seek out an ally, trying to seek out a strong man that they could trust in when things got bad that would come to their rescue and fix all their problems. Usually it was Egypt. Not always, but most of the time it was. But notice what it says in Isaiah 30, beginning in verse 1. Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord, to those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance but not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin, who go down to Egypt without consulting me, who look for help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge. But Pharaoh's protection will be to your shame, Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. 
Now, I recognize that's not exactly applicable to our situation, but perhaps indirectly it is. Because here's the truth. Anyone, anyone who looks to government or a particular political party or a politician to be their savior is bound to be disappointed. Our hope should never be in mankind. It should be in God. In the same way that the backup quarterback is always the most popular person in the stadium, usually the party that's out of power in America is seen as a panacea. They're going to fix everything. If you elect me, I will make the sun come back. I mean, do you really believe all of this stuff? You can't. Will Rogers, the great Oklahoman, put it this way. The more you read and observe about this politics thing, you got to admit that each party is worse than the other. The one that's out always looks the best. Isn't it the case? And in half a century of observing this, I've noticed all kinds of wailing and worship about politicians. When we get this bum out and get my guy in, things are going to change. We're in church, so let's try to tell the truth for just a moment. A lot of you have lived through more elections than I have. Can you really say, with your hand on the Bible, that any of these people that got in, once they got in, your life dramatically changed? No, you can't. So enough of this nonsense that this guy or this person or this party, they're going to save us. They're going to fix everything. I mean, please, every human being, that runs for political office is flawed and they possess feet of clay. And they're going to disappoint you. Just remember that. I'm not saying you can't prefer this one to that one or that one to this one. Of course you can. It's a free country. But as they say these days, pump the brakes on some of that enthusiasm because you're, you're just cruising for disappointment. That's where it's going to end. Here's the third truth. Don't think that you... And your group alone has God on your side. I don't know where things went off the rails, but I think in this particular realm, it's as bad today as it's ever been. I'm not saying that everything, I mean, it always amuses me. People say, things have never been this bad. You realize that Aaron Burr shot Alexander Hamilton to death? I seriously doubt between now and Tuesday that Trump's going to shoot Biden. I don't think. Um but if you're honest, here's the thing. We all think that, oh, this is the right position. That's the right position. I heard a preacher one time put this really poetically. He said, you know, you always hear, well, you always think you're right about things. He said, well, duh, you know, of course. If you didn't think you were right, you would think you were wrong, and that would mean you're an idiot. So everyone thinks they're right, okay? No one's cornered the market on that. It's just that when we start dragging God into this, and, you know, I've noticed something. The Lord sees this exactly as I do. Do you know that? Are you confident of that? Okay, if you're honest, you will admit that there are things wrong right now with the platforms of both parties, with both candidates. Here's a few for consideration. Starting unnecessary wars. Abortion, favoring the rich over the poor, inciting class warfare, white supremacy, coddling rioters, climate change, defunding the police, etc., etc., etc. Are any of you annoyed right now? Why? I didn't say one thing about the Democrats or the Republicans. You assigned blame, not me. The point is, there are both groups that have a lot to be uh, accounted for. Here's the problem. We've become absolutely convinced that our side is right and the other side is wrong, and the people that oppose me couldn't possibly have any redeeming characteristics at all. I heard uh, CNN anchor Don Lemon say something this week I thought was wildly stupid. He, he mentioned, he said, I've had a lot of friends over the last few years that supported Donald Trump. And he said, they are no longer my friends. I thought, what are you, three years old? 
no insult to the three-year-olds who may be here. I've got friends who would fly a Trump flag. I got others that are crossing off the dates on the calendar of when they throw him out. I'm friends with both groups. I would encourage you to expand your horizons a little bit. If you're so narrow that no one who disagrees with you can be your friend, what possible hope do you have of bringing anybody to Jesus Christ? Yeah, I mean, that people are lining up. You know what I need in my life? I need more partisanship and more hatred, and I need more narrow-mindedness. If I could just have those things, then everything would be great. And yet we allow politicians and political parties to do that to us every single time. I want to give you an example as, as we close on just how foolish it is to make that mistake of assuming that God is on my side and my side alone. In my estimation, one man's opinion here, there are very few causes that could be more obviously wrong than supporting slavery. I just don't understand how that ever was something that a Christian would be on board with. You don't believe that? Go read the book of Philemon. That's basically what that short book is about. Paul is writing Philemon about a runaway slave by the name of Onesimus, and he's saying, yeah, I understand what Roman law says. I also understand what God would have you do. That's what he says. But that was a part of American law, at least until a century and a half ago. And yet our 16th president, who was fighting to preserve the Union and end slavery, wasn't nearly as arrogant as we are today in asserting that God is fighting for us and us alone. At the second inaugural, pictured here, listen to what he says. Fellow countrymen, at this second appearing to take the oath of the presidential office, there is less occasion for an extended address than there was at the first. Then, a statement somewhat in detail of a course to be pursued seemed fitting and proper. Now, at the expiration of four years, during which public declarations have been constantly called forth on every point and phase of the great contest, which still absorbs our attention and engrosses the energies of the nation, little that is new could be presented. The progress of our armies, upon which all else chiefly depends, is well known to the public as to myself. And it is, I trust, reasonably satisfactory and encouraging to all. With high hope for the future, no prediction in regard to it is ventured. On the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it. All sought to avert it. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, devoted altogether to saving the Union without war, urgent agents were in the city seeking to destroy without war by negotiation. Both parties deprecated war, but one of them would make war than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war than to let it perish. And the war came. One-eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed generally over the whole Union, but localized in the southern part of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest. All knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union even by war while the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it. Neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and prayed to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any man should dare to ask a just God's assistance 
and wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. But let us judge not that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both north and south this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a loving God always ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet, if God wills, that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so it must still be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. With malice toward none with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. That's one of the greatest speeches that's ever been uttered since humanity has existed. Here's a question. If Abraham Lincoln wasn't completely certain of the Lord's will, are you? Am I? I don't claim to know all of the Almighty's purposes for this country. I don't. There are people in my neighborhood. I had a neighbor the other day when I was trying to mow the lawn. He was going on and on and on that Trump is God's man. I just, I just wanted to mow the lawn. I didn't want to get in a theological argument. I've heard others say that Trump is Satan. I've heard others say that Uncle Joe, like Obi-Wan, is our only hope. You know what? I don't subscribe to any of those positions. I don't. I do this. I pray that God's will be done upon this earth. I pray that it be done in this nation. I pray that we may be good citizens and that we, just like Paul tells us, that we would be active in offering intercession and thanksgiving for those in authority, whoever is in authority. I know that the psalmist says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And while these words obviously were written of ancient Israel and not modern America, they are still to the benefit of any nation that would seek to do God's will, wherever and whenever that nation exists. You know, during that awful civil war, when a significant percentage of America's citizens were killed or maimed, a citizen commented to Lincoln that he should be glad that God was on the north side. And this was what Lincoln's answer to that man was. Sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is that we would be on God's side. May it be so with each of us today. Let's pray together. Father, during this tumultuous time when emotions are high and when there is all type of possibility for anger, for people lashing out, for recriminations, for violence even, Father, we pray that cooler heads will prevail. We pray especially that in your church 
that we would be leaders that our nation could see and our neighbors would notice that our trust is in you and not in any political candidate or any political party. Father, for those that take voting as a sacred responsibility, we pray that you will guard and guide their decisions and that you'll give them insight and wisdom. Father, for our country, we pray for peace, we pray for unity, we pray for tranquility, even in times when all of these are in very short supply. Father, we pray for all of those in positions of authority, be they Republican or Democrat or Independent or whatever they may be. And Father, help us always to be good citizens and to be able to lead the way to the one eternal truth that Jesus is Lord and no one else. In his name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing together. I wandered far away from God, now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've trod, Lord, I'm coming home, coming home, coming home, never more to roam, open wide thine arms of love, Lord, I'm coming home, I've wasted many a prayer. Years. Now I'm coming home, I now repent with bitter tears. Lord, I'm coming home, coming home, coming home, never more to roam up and wide. Thine arms of love, Lord, I'm coming home. I'm tired of sin and straying, Lord. Now I'm coming home. I'll trust thy love, believe thy word, Lord, I'm coming home. Coming home, coming home, never more to roam. Open wide thine arms of love, Lord, I'm coming home. My soul is sick, my heart is sore, now I'm coming home. My strength renewed, my hope restored. Lord, I'm coming home, coming home, coming home. Never more to roam up and wide thine arms of love. Lord, I'm coming. Thank you, Chuck. Brother Eric Martin will dismiss us, and we'll have one more song. Eric. Let us thank uh, Chuck for that great uh, lesson he taught us this morning. Amen. Let us go to our Father in prayer. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for everybody that came out this morning on this Lord's Day to worship you in spirit and truth. We always need to be revived and thankful that our Lord and Jesus Christ gave his life for our sins. He paid up the price for us that someday, if we remain faithful unto death, that we could spend eternity with him. We want to continue to pray for our leadership and our elders at this congregation that lead us through this difficult time, through this pandemic. And pray, Heavenly Father, that we prepare to leave this place. Once again, that you watch over us and keep us safe during the week. This we ask in Son Jesus' name. Amen.
And in relationship to the lesson, hold to God's unchanging hand. Let's just sing the first verse only. We'll be dismissed. Time is filled with swift transition. Not of earth and move can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. God bless you. Have a great day.